um, edited with I Ivan Van Sertiman, is considered the most comprehensive work on the subject. He has many other books, including Introduction to the Study of African Classical Civilizations, The Global African Community, The African Presence in Asia, Australia, and South Pacific. He just completed an African tour, I'm sorry, an African center tour of India, and he's currently planning a tour of Aboriginal Australia. I believe this will be in the year 2000. And he invites others who are interested in participating in this to speak with him. Um, I had a chance to speak with our brother Renoko Rashidi, and, I, I, and you'll find, as I have found, he's a very enlightened individual, a very warm individual, easy to talk to. He shares the same love of Africa that many of us have. Uh, he will be at Professor Bill Mackey Jr.'s and Mackey's Three on Thursday, August 12, 1999, at 7 p.m. That's at 850 St. Mark's Avenue. Uh, we need to know that this brother loves Africa. He's lectured at eight, in eight different countries in the last 10 months. He's traced the, people, the presence of Africans globally. I want you to know that uh, when the lecture is over, you can purchase his videotapes and audio tapes in the back. So without any further ado, let's beat the drums. Let's welcome our educator, our philosopher, our love of Africa. Let's welcome Brother Renoko Rashidi. On your feet. Thank you very much. And Hotep, brothers and sisters, good evening. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging all of our great African ancestors who struggled and fought and lived and died and strove for us to be here tonight. And acknowledging all of our elders in the room tonight and requesting your permission to speak and begin the program. Do I have your permission? Yes. Asante Sana. I'm very, very, very pleased to be here tonight at UAM, or the Oberia Dempsey Center, on behalf of the United African Movement. I think that this is the fourth time I've had a chance to speak uh, at a UAM function. I think the first time was at the, I think, the Masonic Hall in Brooklyn, the Masonic Temple. <laughs> and then over on 125th Street, I think it was the Victoria Theater. Okay. And now twice, this is the second time at Oberia Dempsey. There, you know, there are certain places that you speak and you feel like, you know, it's an honor to be there. And UAM is one of those places. Um, I think the reason 
that I uh, feel privileged to participate in the UAM program is because of the tradition that UAM has. For me, UAM has a kind of a fighting tradition, a, a, a fighting spirit. It's the home of uh, Brother Alton Maddox. And over the years, Brother Alton has become, uh, can everybody hear me? Over the years, and more and more, I've been here the last three weeks, as a matter of fact. I saw Brother Jamal Gorey, who is my good friend and brother from Los Angeles, and an excellent lecture last week, uh, Dr. Jose Pimienta Bay, very enlightening. But I really enjoy more and more listening to Brother Alton. He's very inspiring and he's very uplifting. He's funny to listen to. He's funny when you hear him talking about white folks. He always crackers. <laughs> he always hits the nail on the head. And I feel that is a slide presentation. I don't have to worry about anything else. I'm always very well taken care of. Okay? I want to thank Sister Elizabeth for her introduction and all of her hard work. Give her a round of applause. Although she's not here tonight, let me acknowledge Sister Viola Maddox. Okay? I talked about Brother Alton. Or what good is a king without a queen? Right? And I felt so happy last week when our brother asked all the African men to get up and applaud African women. Okay? I think I tried to get up before anybody else and tried to clap longer and louder than anybody else. Um, so I'm very, very pleased to be here this evening. Now, I'm going to dedicate this presentation to my parents. I've never done that before. Uh, my father, both my parents are still living. My father will be 86 years old in October. And I guess that he is more on my mind than usual, because I'm sad to say that yesterday he was diagnosed with colon cancer. My father has never seen me lecture before. <clears throat> He's never seen me on television. He's never heard me on the radio. He's never read one of my books. He's never browsed to one of my articles. He's never seen anything I've done on the internet. <clears throat> All the trips I've taken, and I've had a chance to take, I think, 20 international lecture tours now, he's never one time called me and said, hey, I heard you went to Egypt. I heard you were in India. Tell me about it. In fact, I, I have to say, as a kind of a confession that for most of my life my father has considered me to be more or less a complete failure because I love African people. Right? That's my father. I love him anyway. Okay? Many times we... Yeah, I have to say that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the key thing. You must love African people. And that is not always easy. Okay? Because African people will test that love. Okay? Now, my mother, on the other hand, is turned 81 years old in June, and she thinks, and she tends to think, like many mothers do, that the sun kind of rises and falls right around me, right? So there's, she's kind of balanced my father out, and I'm grateful to both of them. Now, I have been very blessed. I have a birthday coming up Monday. I'm going to celebrate my 45th birthday. I'm very happy about that. But I'm pleased more than anything because it has been one of the best years I've ever had. And I guess the reason for that is I've had a chance to travel and lecture extensively. In the last 10 months alone, I've had a chance to lecture and travel to uh, Canada. I was able to speak at the ASCAC Eastern Regional uh, Conference uh, hosted by brothers and sisters in Toronto, Canada. Sister Lachella Thornton and Betty uh, Robinson put that together and that was very well. And then um, in November and December of 1998 I had a chance to spend 19 days with Aboriginal Australians. I was over there with black folks. In fact, when Sister Karen asked me, yeah, and I'm going to take a tour next year. It'll be next July. 
The tour is called Looking at Aboriginal Australia Through African Eyes. And it'll include a tour of Aboriginal Australia with a stopover in New Zealand on the way back to deal with the Maori people. Right? Now, when Aboriginal Australia would a stopover in New Zealand on the way back to deal with the Maori people. Right? Now, when Sister Karen asked me to do this, pre asked me to speak, the difficulty I had was uh, what would be the subject matter. And I thought about Australia. In fact, I, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to come back to UAM sometime within the next six to eight months, I hope, and do a presentation on black folk in Australia because they are the deepest, most profound, most spiritual people I've ever encountered anywhere in the world. Now, just a note on them, because I have a little more time than usual. I was hoping Brother Alton would be here to speak, but I guess he cannot be here tonight, so it gives me a little bit more time just to introduce the subject. Black people in Australia who call themselves black fellas and who are commonly referred to as aborigines, and that's interesting because that's a name they don't like. They consider that something of an offensive term. They refer to themselves as black fellas. And they, yeah, black fellas. Mm -hmm. And depending on the part of the country they're in, they might also call themselves Koori or Guri or Murrays, or Binning people, or Noonga. They say that they have been there for 120,000 years. Many of them feel as though they have been there from the very beginning of time itself. And all over the country, I went by myself. I was invited to speak at a conference in Queensland, but I didn't want to go there just to speak at a conference. I wanted to see much of the country. And thank you very much, by the way, brothers and sisters, for the donations. You don't realize, some of us, how important that is to this work, okay? Because I went over there, I paid for that trip mostly myself. And it's not always easy. So I had a chance to go there, and one thing that I can do, I pride myself on doing, I can ask some questions to the point that many people are really annoyed. I will ask questions because I have an insatiable appetite for learning. I want to know everything. In ancient Egypt, our ancestors used to say, ignorance is evil. Over here, a lot of us say, ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is happiness. Ignorance is joy. Because with knowledge comes responsibility. And a lot of us are not willing to assume that responsibility. I will ask some questions, and I ask brothers and sisters everything virtually that I could think of. And they were all too happy to respond because most of them have not had contact with African people from the United States. They see us on TV, but that's about the extent of it. And many African people from the United States go to Australia. When I was over there, Snoop Doggy Dog came. Janet Jackson came. Uh, Boys to Men was performing over there. But rarely, and a lot of athletes, African athletes come over there, but rarely do you have people who come and interact with the local African or black populations. So I tried to make up for all of that. I asked everything. Now, to be an Aboriginal, there are four criteria. First, you must have what is called a skin name, and which in and of itself is a lecture. I never did figure out what a skin name was. You must see yourself as Aboriginal. You must be identified and accepted by the community as Aboriginal. And you must have what is called a creation story or a dream time story. I'm sure some of you may have heard of the concept of dreaming or the dream time. It's a whole nother way of looking at reality. A whole nother way of looking at the world. Dream time stories are kind of creation stories. How the world came to be. How you came to be. How the earth was formed. They refer to the earth as mother. And they see themselves as the custodians of the land. One sister tried to explain to me what a dream time story was. And she had a painting, a dream time painting. And I was in a place called Sydney, the largest city in Australia. And Sydney has a black community, if you just bear with me, called Redfern. Redfern is the black or African community of Sydney. 
Redfern is the only place I know of in Australia, if not the world, certainly in Australia, where it's legal to shoot up heroin. And every day when I was there, I would see somebody drive up in a station wagon full of uh, alcoholic prep pads and syringes. All you have to do is bring your heroin. And children see this. Naturally, this is in the black community. Police drive up and down the street. They don't bother anybody. And you can see junkies, heroin addicts, with needles in their arm walking up and down the street. And people come from all over Australia to partake in that. This is the African community. It's frightening to see the poverty and the disease. The domestic abuse that African people themselves are involved in because of the intense oppression. The substance abuse. Virtually every black person I saw over the age of 24 looked terrible. From cigarette smoking and alcohol abuse because the oppression is so great. They heard that an Af so-called African-American, because I don't even like to use that expression, I'm an African and I'm so proud to be an African, right? When you add the hyphen American, I tend to be rather insulted when you do that. Sometimes I use that expression for familiarity's sake. They heard that an African-American professor was visiting and so people in Redfern began to gather. And I was in a room on a Sunday morning, it must have been 15 or 20 people, everybody was talking at the same time. And I'm trying to listen to everybody. My head is like on a swivel. I'm turning around, trying to hear everybody. So one sister brought a dream time story. And she tried to explain it, and I had no idea what she was talking about. And I guess she could see the look of puzzlement on my face. And finally she said, brother, it's simple. Let me explain it to you like this. She said, we believe that we were in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and that Adam and Eve got kicked out and we didn't. Okay? And these black people lived in peace and harmony for most of that 120,000 years. And then the white man came. He came. And when he comes, wherever he goes, he brings death and destruction, murder and rape with him. They follow in his wake. And I would love for somebody to tell me one exception to that. I'm a historian, and I think I'm a very good one. I have not been able to find an exception to that rule. Now, on, in January, I think January 26, 1788, four shiploads of British, mostly convicts, the scum of the earth, convicts, and with them came a few soldiers, administrators and missionaries and they did a number on our people now at that time there may have been as many as three million black people in Australia within a period of 50 years that population had been reduced to 40,000 people now, I'm working on a book on Aboriginal Australia now and you know I can only read the material in limited portions I have to put the books down you almost have to immunize yourself emotionally to what happened Today, in Australia, black people, the black fellas, make up exactly 1.6% of the total population. They have been totally dispossessed of the land. They're less than 2% of the um, total population. But black men make up 70% of the prison population. Now get to that. From one, it sounds familiar, don't it? From 1.6% of the total population to 70% of the prison population. Black women, 50% of the prison population. I went to Aboriginal communities, happy to go there, in many cases, in Australia where unemployment figures range from 90 to 100%. Until 1967, brothers and sisters, Black people in Australia were not considered human beings. They were considered flora and fauna until 32 years ago. Some of them showed me dog tags that they used to have to wear. You used to have to get permission from a white man called a protector, ironically enough, to go from one side of the street to the other side of the street. The average life expectancy, brothers and sisters, of a black man in Australia is 45 years. 
So I hope to be able to come back and talk about Aboriginal Australia, our relationship with the brothers and sisters there, and show you some of the images that I've got. I, some of the best photographs I have are from Australia. And then in March, I did a lecture for black people in Bangkok, Thailand. I'd never been in Thailand before. And then within two days from there, I was able to go and lecture in Hawaii. And in Hawaii, I was able to lecture to indigenous Pacific Islanders, some of whom are blacker than anybody in the room today. In March and April, I was able to some of whom are blacker than anybody in the room today. In March and April, I was able to lead a tour. The ancestors have been good to me. I have been blessed to India for the third time. It was my first tour and my third trip to India. And there, I saw in the state of Orissa, which is in the east. I had never been there before. I saw the blackest human beings I've ever seen. And what was so, and these are called tribal people, Santals and Mundas. And they were so black that sometimes when I <laughs> use my camera, the flash would just reflect off of them. Okay, that's how black they were. But what was so, and they, opened, they welcomed us with open arms. But what was so special about it to me was that the blacker they were, the higher their sense of self-esteem. I saw one brother who was, he was blacker than all the rest of them. And this is, everybody's dark. But this brother stood out. And I saw him, and I guess everybody in the group, we had 16 people. We saw him, and he saw us. I saw him and he saw me. And he just started smiling and I started smiling. And I felt that I could read his mind and that he could read my mind. And I was saying, damn, that brother is black. And I know he must have been saying, yeah, I'm black and don't I look good. Now that was so unique. <laughs> because you know, most of us have been taught the very opposite of that. That the blacker you are, the uglier you are. And don't you know what perpetuates a lot of that is these music videos. Television. And these images are picked up by African people all over the world. They got brothers in Senegal sagging now. Okay? Black folks in Ghana arguing about who's the lightest. This is in Africa. And then in uh, May and June, I was able to go to Russia. Now, you may ask yourself the question, Renoko, you were doing pretty good so far, but what would you go to Russia for? Because there are African people over there, too. And there's one brother in particular named Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin. And I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about Pushkin. Pushkin is considered the father of Russian literature. He's called the Russian Adam, the Russian Spring, the Russian morning, the Russian counterpart to Shakespeare, the father of all things Russian. And he has African blood running through his veins. Not only that, but he was proud of it. He gloried in his African ancestry. So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about that tonight. And I had a chance, uh, this was a program organized by, I believe, Mega Evers College in the African American Studies Department at Chicago State University. And I just got back from India. I had been traveling. I was on a roll. I felt like the ancestors had a mission. And we should all feel like we have a mission in life. Okay? I even heard, I recently got an a excellent, I think, quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King who said at the height of, I believe, at the height of the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955, check this out, speaking of a mission, he said, let future generations say that there live a great people, a black people, who injected new meaning into the veins of civilization. Now that's deep to me. That's profound. So I was over there. Uh, the trip cost about $1,500. I said, oh, I, I can afford that. It's worth it because I felt connected with Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin. And I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But not only that, I said, not only do I want to go over there, but I want to give a presentation. 
there was a, this is the 200th anniversary of Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin. He, he would have been 200 about a month ago. And not only did I want to go over there, but I figured since I'm going, I might as well give a speech. And they asked me to speak on the image of Africa in Russia during the time of Pushkin. I said, that's all right, that sounds cool, I wasn't getting paid for it. But sometimes it's an honor to give a presentation. I felt like I was exalting our ancestors. And I pray every time I give a presentation that let the ancestors be with me. Let them speak through me and allow me to exalt them above all others. And whenever I get an opportunity to do that, I jump on it. But after the second day of the, pre of the symposium, it was only two days, the whole trip was only nine days, and believe me, that's long enough to be in Russia because there's too many crackers over there, believe me, they're everywhere, right? Roving bands of racist skinheads roam the streets. Brother Muda Baruka, who you may or may not be familiar with, had a poem called, It's Not Good to Stay in a White Man's Country Too Long. And I was over there long enough. I was ready to roll to get out of there. I said, you know, after all the presentations that I have heard, I came to the conclusion that these people, many of whom were well-meaning, believed <clears throat> that Pushkin was the only African in the history of Russia, or Europe itself for that matter, to make a significant contribution. And I wanted to correct that. And the other thing that I wanted to deal with was the fact of Pushkin's own genealogy. Now his great-great-grandfather, or his great-grandfather on his mother's side was an African prince, a brother named Ibram, who eventually, his name was, I think they call it anglicized, they start calling him Abraham. He was taken from Eritrea about 1695. And he was taken to Russia. Now at that time it was popular to have Africans in the royal circles or the, or the court among the nobility. So this brother was very precocious. He was very bright. And he attracted the attention of the Tsar of Russia, the Emperor of Russia, Tsar Peter I. Sometimes people call him Peter the Great. White folks do at any rate. And this man was so enamored of this little brother that he adopted him as his godson, sent him to Paris to study, and he studied engineering. He became the, the finest engineer in Russia and a major general in the Russian army. Now, this, according to many people, was the advent of the African presence in Europe. So number one, I wanted to say that there were many African people in Europe who distinguished themselves, and the first people in Europe were Africans. And that number two, our history did not begin as a slave or servant of other people. That is very important that we deal with. There are three major phases of the African presence in world history, and Dr. Clark used to say that African history is merely the missing pages in world history. We are a global people. We are everywhere. We've been everywhere. There are maybe a billion of us around the world. And once we realize that there are so many of us in so many places with a common history, that's half the battle right there. And don't you know white folks are definitely afraid of that? And that's my mission is to go all over the world and get the information and bring it back so we can share it. So I said, look, I'm not going to do a presentation on the image of Africa in Russia during the time of Pushkin. I want to do a presentation on the African presence in Europe. And that is what I want to share with you tonight. Now, the last trip that I have taken internationally, last month I had an opportunity to spend three weeks lecturing and traveling and researching among African people in Trinidad. I had never been in the Caribbean before. And it was, yeah, until I, in, unless you consider Brooklyn the Caribbean. But I had never been, uh, in Trin I had never been in the Caribbean before. And so I had an opportunity to lecture in four places, actually three cities. I lectured in, I think, Point Fortin or Cape Fortin a place called San Fernando in Port of Spain. Big crowds. People are hungry for information. And then from there, and I'm going to talk about a lot of this in detail tomorrow night at Brother Mackey's 
So I hope you will come out. I won't be showing any slides, so I'll have a chance to give a very good overview, and then we can have time for plenty of discussion. And then the major reason that I'd taken the trip in the first place is I was invited to speak at a conference called the International Reunion of the African Family in Latin America. And this took place in a place called San Jose de Barlavento in Venezuela. I had never heard of San Jose de Barlavento. I couldn't find it on a map. I couldn't find it in a big, thick book on Venezuela. It's not even listed. This is a district, Barlavento, in the state of Miranda. And this is east of um, Caracas. And this is a place where Maroons, runaway Africans who refused to accept enslavement, came and established themselves. And I started to say earlier that there are three major phases in the presence of African people around the world that need to be looked at. And I emphasize them all the time in my presentation tonight, all the time, and my presentation tonight will highlight that in Europe. Number one, that humanity began in Africa, that we, brothers and sisters, as you know, are the original people on this planet. Okay. Those were the good old days, when we were the only people on this planet. <laughs> and that from Africa, we peopled the rest of the world. We're the first people on the planet, African people in Europe, in Asia, in the Western Hemisphere, in Australia, the islands of the Pacific, we came first. Number two, the role that African people have played in the development of classical civilizations all over the world. It's one thing to say that you were first. It's something different to say, to be able to point out to what you did. And we have done virtually everything. And the third phase is the enslavement phase. Slaves didn't come from Africa. African people were captured in Africa and enslaved and dispersed involuntarily around the world. Now the problem is, most of us, when we begin our analysis of history, we begin with the third phase. We forget about African people as the original people on the planet, a lot of times, not the people in here. We forget about or, or refuse to acknowledge the role that African people have played in the development of civilization and concentrate on enslavement. But even there, if we're going to look at enslavement, it's important that we look at slave resistance. Those African people who struggled in face of overwhelming odds to maintain their basic human dignity, who fought and resisted all day and all night to maintain their basic human dignity. You cannot say enough about those brothers and sisters. Their blood runs through our veins today. Now, in Barlavento, this conference lasted for a week. It was organized by a group called the Organization of Africans in the Americas, which is based in D.C. Week-long conference, there were African people from virtually every country in the Western Hemisphere. From South America, the only country that was not represented was Chile. You had brothers and sisters from Bolivia, Uruguay, Paraguay, Argentina, Suriname, Cayenne, Guyana, Brazil, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela. Places I had never heard of before. One brother, big brother, looked like he could have been a football player. Dark African, husky brother, from Ecuador, got up at the end of one presentation, broke down and cried like a baby and said, thank you for making me feel proud to be black for the first time in my life. This is a 40-year-old man, all right? For the first time in his life. Most of them were not even aware that Africans lived in, these very, in the country next door to them. From Central America, there were delegations from Honduras, Nicaragua, Mexico, strong contingent of black folks from Mexico, Costa Rica, Panama, the only countries that were not represented in Central America were Guatemala and El Salvador. There were brothers and sisters from Canada. The head of the Nation of Islam and the Dominican Republic was there. Black people from all over the Caribbean. We lit it up for a week. They were drummers. They were dancers. They were performers every night. They had different cuisine from African people in, a very, in one part of the Western Hemisphere or another every night. Some brothers flew from South Africa, from Senegal, from Ethiopia. 
And I had a chance to do three major presentations. I did three keynote presentations, and I assure you, I did you proud. I was at my best. Okay? And then, capping that off, I was invited to go to Guyana, the only English-speaking country in South America, to speak for Emancipation Day. Emancipation Day is catching on in the Caribbean, I think Ghana too, uh, and Guyana. And I told the brothers and sisters, they are members of the Guyanese community in Los Angeles who invited me to speak, to go down there. And I said, well, look, I'm going to be in Venezuela anyway. Venezuela and Guyana border each other. Maybe I should go before emancipation, then we'll just save that money. So I said, all right, we'll send you down there. So I spent eight days in Guyana. And I have to say that the brothers and sisters down there were hungry. They were hungry. They weren't just hungry. They were hungry for African history. I spoke in one presentation in an old dilapidated high school, St. George's, I think, I think it's St. George, no, St. Mark's, St. Matthew's, I forget, high school in downtown Guyana. The room was packed. 350 people came. Didn't charge people a cent. Nobody left early. They were on their feet. I had a chance to speak in a place called Iflut, I think it was. Um, and three or four other cities. One presentation I gave, the prime minister of the country came. I had a chance to have private meetings with the mayors of the two largest cities in Guyana. So over the last 10 months, I have had a wonderful experience. I'm planning to go to Cambodia and photograph the ruins of an African civilization called Angkor in November. Next month, I plan to be with African people in Mexico, in Fiji, in Australia, in Zimbabwe, in New Zealand, and who knows where else. So it's wonderful to be here. I want to thank you all for your continued support, because if not for you, I couldn't have done all those things. Hmm? Not for you and the ancestors. So give yourself a round of applause. Now, having said all of that, and having given a long introduction, let me begin the slide presentation itself. And I want to take you on a trip with me not only to Russia, but the African presence in early Europe. Now, this is a slide presentation that I wanted to begin with. I think the last time I was in New York, uh, I had a chance to speak at the First World Forum, another place I'm always delighted to be, Brother Bill Jones and Sister Keffa, like my mother and father out here. And I had a chance to take this photograph. And I had been asking you know, when I do presentations, I try to not only show images of African people historically, but African people today, because we make a connection between the past, the present, and the future. I think that's an African concept of time. And this sister right here, I've been saying, I want you to send me a photograph. I want you to send me a photograph. And she put off sending me a photograph for nine months. So I had a little disposable camera with two pictures left on there. And this is Sister Charcy McIntyre. So <laughs> I sat next to Sister Charcy and we were becoming very good friends. Okay? I remember her sitting right down here in the front row or very close and we would laugh and joke. She didn't always agree with everything I had to say. But that's all right. If you're able to sit and talk to each other and reason with each other, that's all right. Okay. Now, so I, she said, Renoko, I'm sorry I haven't sent you a picture, so why don't you take this photograph? So here we have Sister Dr. Charlotte Lawrence McIntyre, Sister Charcy for me. And next to her is my own queen in the back, Sister Tanya Washington, my best friend and travel companion and all of that. Um, you can say a low tour when you go back and buy a tape in the back. All right? <laughs> Next to her is another dear friend of mine, uh, UAM member, Sister Beverly Walton. Give her a big round of applause. <laughs> and next to her is Sister Eloise Dix. Okay? I think you may know her too. Now, I took this photograph. I thought it came out very good. And one week later, from that day, I got a phone call in Los Angeles. Somebody says, Sister, Sister Charcy, 
was dead. One week later. Now, I feel like that was the ancestors making that connection. I believe that we have some powerful ancestors. A lot of times we don't recognize that, but I think we have some powerful ancestors. And they speak to us and give us messages. We don't always receive them, or we don't acknowledge them. But anyway, I wanted to begin with that slide, which I think is a very powerful picture. And I would like to think that she is somewhere smiling down on us right now. Next slide. Now, this slide is important, and some of these you will have seen before, but I assure you some of them will be quite new. I have never shown before. Some of them I just got processed yesterday. Now, this is an African woman, a black woman, from the Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal. And this is off the eastern coast of India. And I put this slide up here because I think uh, that this is, I hope you can see it all the way. Is the head cut off? I don't know. You can see it. Um, I think that these people are reminiscent of probably what the first human beings on this planet look like. Short black people, tightly curled hair, dark skin. And from Africa, beginning probably about 300,000 years ago, I think, we went out and populated the entire world. And from Africa, beginning probably about 300,000 years ago, I think, we went out and populated the entire world, including Europe. Next. Now, this slide is the first known statuette in Europe. Not the first depiction of an African, but the first person that we know of depicted in the art of Europe. And I use this up here, up there, to show the striking similarity between that little bitty sister that I showed you with the child on her back and this right here. This is called the Venus of Willendorf. And the reason it's called that is because this piece was found, I think, in either 1904 or 1911 near a place called Willendorf, Austria. It's made of soapstone. It's only about four inches high. I've actually had a chance to see a replica of this artifact. Uh, you will look, reverse it, brother. Please go back. Now go forward. The similarity cannot be a coincidence. The hair, the behind, all of that. Okay? Next. And there's just a follow-up. I always can't resist but to put that one in there. Now this is what I think the first people on the planet look like. And they went into Asia, they went into Europe, they went into Australia. And they can be found in the art and iconography. They can be found in the folk tales and myths and legends. Next. And these are just same folk. And this actually takes us to Asia. I've been called an, an authority or a specialist on the African presence in Asia. And this is what the first people I believe on the planet look like. Next. Now, this takes us, and I'm going to take probably about an hour or so, so bear with me. I'll try not to be too dull. This takes us to, um, and in, if we could turn off one, this light over here. Is that a problem? I think it'll, it'll show up much better. And I could use a little more water, please. rate let's try to move on these are the ones that we need over here um, this takes us to the first civilization excellent thank you brother appreciate that in Europe and this is actually not in Europe per se I guess when you're in power you can write history to suit yourself for example I was told when I was a kid in junior high school they call it middle thank you sister Liz uh, middle school very good That, there, that a continent, by definition, was a large body of land. In fact, somebody was asking me about continents before I got up here. A large body of land completely surrounded by water on all four sides. And the continents that I was given was Antarctica, 
Australia, Asia, Africa, North and South America, and Europe. Now, how does Europe fit that criteria? You understand? Somebody said, I think it was Dr. Wade Nobles, that the essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and make them live according to that definition. This is from a little island called Crete. And this island is midway between Africa and Europe. It's a small island. If you've been to Kemet and you fly back from Kemet to Europe and onto the United States, you fly over Crete. And by the way, I made a major, I took my glasses off, I made a major omission. Let me thank Minister Clemson Brown for all of his participation and support. And get his brother a round of applause. Now, when I went to Trinidad, and when I went to Guyana, I was something of a celebrity among African people. And the reason for that is some of the brothers and sisters had come to UAM and purchased some of the videotapes. In fact, they play these videotapes on a TV program in Georgetown, Guyana, called The African Presence. People were stopping me on the street. I have to thank Brother Minister Clemson Brown for that. Okay. Now, this is Crete. Now, the Afri or, or black man from Crete. Uh, this is a civilization that developed in the third millennium BC, about 2900 BC. And apparently the people who put it together were black people moving out, excellent, out of Egypt, out of lower Egypt, or lower Kemet, and settling in Crete. And this is an example as to what the first people looked like. It's called Minoan Crete, because the first ruler was supposed to have been a man named Minos. And if you want more information on that, there's a very good book by John G. Jackson called Introduction to African Civilizations. Next slide. And that's just a shell inlay. Now this takes us to Greece. And this is one of my favorite photographs. This is an African child, a black girl from uh, Corinth in Greece in the fourth century BC. Now you hear black folks all the time on the universities talking about black Greeks. But they are talking about fraternities and sororities, but there really were African people who lived in ancient Greece. Next. The nose been knocked off. Now this piece is, you can find this in the Brooklyn Museum. And this is an African from, uh, actually from Western Turkey. But it was at a time when the Greeks dominated that part of Turkey. And this is a beautiful, beautiful piece. And the hairstyle looks so much like what you see many brothers and sisters wearing their hair like today. I wish I could get mine like that, but as you can see, it's a bit too late for that. Next slide. This is of a so-called Greek goddess. She is the most powerful goddess in the Greek pantheon. Her name is Pallas Athena. She is the patron goddess of the Greek city of Athens in Greek mythology. And I grew up reading comic books and, and reading about Hercules and all these people, never having any idea that there was an African presence there. I believe that if you peel back the surface on virtually anything on this planet, you're going to find an African presence. Because we have been everywhere, we've done everything. This is a signet ring, a ring with the goddess there. Now, the old Greeks who realized the importance of Africa, people like Herodotus and Plato and all of these fellows who spent time, Pythagoras, who spent time in Africa as students, talked about an African goddess named Night. And in their works, they pointed out that Night was the basis of this deity here. She's a goddess of the intellect. She's the goddess of weaving, but she's also a goddess of warfare. In other words, she was a sister not to be played with. Uh -huh. And you can't, can you get any blacker than that? Next. Now, this is a depiction here of Hercules in search of his son. 
I'm glad to say that whatever's going on down there, that does not represent Hercules' son. This is because I don't know what's happening right there. If you get a look at, you can see the little freaky scene, the bestiality. I don't know what that's all about. I found this in the Los Angeles uh, County Library, and all I saw was Hercules. And it was months before I looked down and tried to figure out what was going on. This is a depiction of the so-called Greek hero, Hercules right there. I told Brother Clarence it looked kind of like him, Brother Clarence Dudley, okay? Next slide. This is an African in early Rome. My the room got quiet. Now, I really have tried over the years, and again, I have to thank you for your donations. I have tried over the years to put together the finest slide library I possibly could. I want to have representations of African people everywhere. And when I get out of here, when I become an ancestor, I want to bequeath this to an African school. There's an expression that says a picture is worth a thousand words. I think I'm a good lecturer, but some of these photographs are incredible. And this is of an adolescent um, black man from early Rome. Next. This is an African pope. There are three African popes that I am aware of. The first one, first two of them, in fact, were born in Africa. The other was born in Rome of African parents. The first one is named Victor I. Victor I was the pontiff from about, 195, from about 195 to about 200 A.D. I think he was the 13th pope, and he was responsible for Easter being celebrated on Sunday every year. That was his contribution. And then we have this brother right here named St. Miltiades. Miltiades comes to us about 310 A.D. And Miltiades is uh, distinguished because it was under him that Constantine converted to Christianity. Most people have heard of Constantine. He's the one who supposedly, on his way to kill some people, saw what he claimed to be a, a, a cross in the sky, and it said something to the effect, by this sign we shall conquer, and converted to Christianity. And under his reign, the persecution of Christians was supposed to have ceased. This happened under the reign of an African pope. All kinds of Africans in Rome. By the second century A.D., one-third of all the members of the Roman Senate were born in Africa. You have the greatest writer in Roman history, a black man named Terence Afar, a man who says something to the effect, I am a man, and therefore nothing human is alien to me. This is a man studied by Julius Caesar, by Cicero, by Horace, and yet very few people acknowledge that he was African. And then you have a third African pope named St. Galatius. Three African popes. Now, I'm not a Christian. Okay? I can't get over the fact that, if nothing else, the first slave ship was called the Good Ship Jesus. I, I can't get over that. I can't get over the fact that in Mombasa, Kenya today, you have a slave dungeon called Fort Jesus. Now, I don't mean to step on anybody's toes, because I try to respect everybody's religion. But I can't get over that. But if you are a Christian, then you need to know something about the history of Christianity, whether you like it or not. Okay? We must be seekers of truth. And sometimes the truth is not what we want or what we expect. This is from a basilica in early Rome. Next. This is an African Roman emperor. His name is Septimius Severus. Now, I'm going to do a residency at him. I won't tell you which one, a major university in the Midwest in the middle of September. And I was there a couple years ago, and I showed this slide. And it was like 95% Africans in the audience. So I showed this slide of this powerful African emperor of Rome, Septimius Severus. And I said, this brother was very powerful. But I can't say much for his taste in women. Because, see, I believe African men should be with African women, and African women should be with African men. That's, that's what I believe. And I thought since it was a majority African audience, everybody would say, right on, Brother Renoko, speak the truth. And at the end of the presentation, wouldn't you know it, 
an African got up, and it was a black woman who was mad enough to come, virtually come on the stage and punch me out, saying, how dare you interject your opinion? And I said, sister, I'm an African man before I'm a scholar or a historian, and I got to speak the truth. Now, this went on, this, uh, this must have been 200 people now. This went around the room for an hour. Black folks taking sides on the issue. Now, even there were a handful of white people and Asians in the room. Even they got up and said, I respect how you feel and I understand it. It was the Africans who had a problem with it. So finally, one sister got up and said, all right, you said that. One person got up and said, this is a sister, an older sister, she says she was dressed very culturally, and uh, she wasn't that old, about 50, young woman. And she got up and said, you know, most speaking to the audience, because I had just about had it, you know, I'm about ready to walk off the stage. And finally she says, look, I want to tell you something. I'm older than most of you. And she says, I have a daughter who's a teenager who watches a lot of TV. And she said, one time her daughter told her, she says, Mommy, in order for me to marry a successful black man, do I have to be white? See, that's the logical extension of the insanity that we're dealing with. If you are proud of who you are, you want to be with an African. If you are proud of who you are, you want to worship God in an African image. Okay. Next slide. My brother, if you would focus that a bit. And thank you so much for operating that projector. Give this brother a round of applause, the projectionist. Okay. And the security. You aren't going to let anything happen. Give these brothers a round of applause. I assume they're not getting paid any money for the work they're doing. They're doing it out of love of African people. That must be acknowledged all the time. Now, this is Hannibal Barca. Hannibal uh, is an African who gave Rome hell. He is a member of the Barca family, B-A-R-C-A. -A. When he was a youngster, I think when he was about 13, at a public ceremony, he swore undying hatred to the Roman Empire. When he was about, because they were trying to wipe the Carthaginians, his people out. Carthage is a state in North Africa. It was called Carthagena, which means the new town, and it was established by African people from Asia and indigenous people to the continent. Now, when he was about 21, he was elected democratically the commander-in-chief of the Carthaginian army. His, his whole family, the Barca family, was known as the Lion's Brood, and they were serious warriors. His father is believed to have been the founder of the Greeks of the Spanish city of Barcelona. He led an army out of Africa, through Spain, across the Alps with elephants, and fought the Romans on the doorstep of Rome and established his fame. Ultimately, unfortunately, after a series of three wars, the Carthaginians were defeated. The Romans just wore them down through sheer weight of numbers. And although Hannibal lived 2,000 years ago, his spirit is with us. His deeds are with us. Time has not diminished the glory of his deeds. Next slide. Focus. Now, perhaps of all the images of Africa or Africans in Europe, the sequence that I will show you now are perhaps the most interesting and powerful and provocative. And of course, these are the black Madonnas. This one is from Paris, and I believe Paris itself is named after an African. I believe the original name of Paris was Paraisidos, or the Grove of Isis. Isis is the European name for Aset, a name which means the throne. Next. And there she is with the child Heru. This is where we get the word hero from. The African names are so important. Aset and Heru as opposed to Isis and Horus. Isis and Horus, I don't know if they mean anything. Aset means the throne, and you usually identify her as an African woman with a throne on top of her head. I don't know what Horus means, but Heru is where we get the word hero from. Next. 
And this is just a sequence. Focus it, please. And these are some of my favorite slides. This is a black Madonna and child from Switzerland. Now, all of the black Madonnas are considered miracle workers. And I've actually had a chance to do some research, and I've been able to read some of the prayers written to these Madonnas. They are incredible. And they are all kind of miracles associated with them. Some of them are supposed to have stopped a cholera epidemic. They were actually, these icons were actually taken into war at the head of armies because it was thought it would give them victory. When the crusade was launched in the 13th century, the crusaders prayed at a shrine of a black Madonna in Lupe in France. Joan of Arc's mother would pray to a black Madonna in, in France every day. And all kinds of stories have come to me about them, how they came to be black, that they represent the subconscious, the unconscious, that the worshipers use a lot of candles and incense, and the smoke and soot accumulated on the face, the hands, and the feet. I don't know why it didn't get on the rest of it or why they didn't clean it off. That they use bad paint. The paint turned bad. Okay? Let's look at some of these with bad paint. Next. Focus. I'm going to get to that one. This is from Spain. This one is so black that when the photograph was taken, it looked blue. And even little JC seems to be given the peace sign that we used to give in the 60s and 70s. Next. These are, this is from Russia. Next. Let me just go through this sequence. And, and they are really beautiful. Look at the little frizzy hairstyle. Is that paint too? Next. Next. These are all from Russia. Next. Focus. Now, if there was only one or two of these, maybe you have an argument. There are more than 500 of these scattered all over Europe. where they could kiss the feet of a black dog. That's serious. Next. No, 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 hold it. This is the one, the major one from Poland. And there are a number of these I just found out. And you see it has a scar on the face. That was done in battle. These, these icons, as I pointed out, were actually brought in, at the head of, invade, of, of armies because it was thought that their mere presence would bring them victory. And this is the favorite Madonna of the reigning pope. Next. This is from Krakow in Poland. Now, Sister Tanya just gave me this one a couple months ago. Look at the hairstyle. That's black. Next. These are all from Poland. Next. This is the whole family. Next. And there's Jesus himself. This is from Constantinople. Next. Now, focus, my brother. This is from Germany, and this is a black saint. Now, Brother uh, Jose showed some images of this saint last week, but not this slide. And this is one of my favorite slides right here. This is an image of the black Saint Maurice, who by tradition was born in Egypt. And this is a life-size statue in a place called Magdeburg, Germany, in 1240. And for those who have to go, the videos are in the back. You can purchase the videotapes, and these slides are on there. Uh, now, I have to tell one quick story about this. I was doing, I live in San Antonio now. I'm born in California, an African born in California, grew up there. Living in San Antonio. No, turn it down, brother, because I want you to focus on the slide. Thank you. And I did a presentation to a group of real unruly youth, some Africans who probably didn't know where Africa was. And I did a presentation, and little children. And one little brother named Danny was operating a projector. And I showed this slide, and Danny couldn't control himself. He jumped up and says, he looks like an ape. Another little black kid, like he just came from the country. He looks like a monkey. I was so hurt 
So I just had to just sit down and collect myself for about, I didn't, for about 10 minutes. I didn't even know what to say. Is that a terrible thing to say? St. Maurice. Next. This is the slide my brother showed last week. Next. Next. And this is St. Maurice. Now that banner, in fact, if you focus, this is St. Maurice close to me and St. George and the Dragon on the other side. You see the dragon downstairs. Everybody's heard of St. George and the Dragon, but hardly nobody's heard about St. Maurice, who was patron saint of the Germanic Empire for about 300 years. And you have more than 300 shrines in Germany alone to St. Maurice, a black patron saint. Even Hitler had to acknowledge St. Maurice. Next. This is a depiction of a, a brother named Casper. And this is from Munich, Germany from around 1500. Now the brother is sharp, you gotta give him that. He needs a piece of kente cloth in his hand, okay? Next. This is from Sweden. And this is a depiction of the Swedish court secretary. His name is Adolf Baden, B-A-D-I-N. He was Swedish court secretary from, I think, 1760 to 1804. I was given uh, this, uh, this little photograph about this. You can't imagine the work you have to do to put these kind of slides together. You've got to be something of a detective, believe me. I was given, thank you, this poster. This was a part of a poster. And of all places, Nottingham, England in 1993. I was over there promoting a book. And I thought so much of it that I had it cut out and had it converted into a slide. This brother is playing chess and what looks like a jerry curl 200 years ago in Sweden. What are you doing over there? Nobody has told his story. I haven't found any information in a book. A lot of our work is just beginning. Next. This is St. Benedict the Moor. He's the founder of the Benedictine Order of Monks. This is from Sicily. Next. This is Alejandro or Alessandro de' Medici. He was the reigning Duke of Florence for five years. His father was a cardinal in Sicily. Next. This is a black knight, obviously, from France in the 14th century, from Normandy. Now, this photograph I got in a book, and there's a white woman with him. I just cut her off. That's what I should have did with the one of the Roman Emperor. I, I just cut her off there. There were black knights. They were not mythological at all. You have a man named Ceremorian, who was the greatest knight in medieval Europe. He's described as black as a crow, black as a raven, black as pitch, black as tar. He was a knight of the round table with King Arthur. Next. This is the Chevalier de St. George's. He was born in Guadeloupe in the Caribbean in 1745. He moved to France. He became the greatest ice skater, the greatest pianist, the greatest swordsman, ladies' man in France. Next. <laughs> this is the original Alexander Dumas. Now, he too was born in the Caribbean. He became a major general in the French army. He went to Egypt with Napoleon in 1798 uh, and fell out with Napoleon because of the desecration of the Egyptian monuments, the Chemite monuments. Next. Now, this is his son who achieves fame as a writer. He's the author of The Count of Monte Cristo, The Three Musketeers, The Man in Iron Man, an African, by our definition of African. He wrote a book called The Black Tulip, The Black Corsican. He gave us the expression, one for all and all for one. But he also gave us another expression, and that is, a man's mind is elevated to the status of the women with whom he associates. <laughs> a man's mind is elevated to the status of the women with whom he associates. I try to follow that dictum. Next. By the way, his son became the president of the French Academy of Sciences. 
So there's three generations of Africans in 18th century France, 18th, 19th century France. This is just um, a depiction of an African uh, from Morocco found in early France. And that's a beautiful piece of art. Some of these are just breathtakingly beautiful pieces of art. Next. This is from England. This is Stonehenge. I had a chance to go there. And uh, some people believe that this was established by African people. England, people in England believe that. Next. These are just uh, family crests from Shields. Once again, Brother Bay showed some of these last week. Next. Another one from England. Next. This is Charlotte Sophia. This is whom the city of Charlotte, North Carolina is named after. She was the Queen of England at the time of the so-called American Revolution. She is the, I think, grandmother, great-grandmother of Victoria. She had 14 children. Some of the homeliest children you ever laid your eyes on. Okay. Next. They must have took after the daddy. Right? Uh, these, this is just uh, Moore's heads in England. Now, next. Let's, let's move on. This is from early Spain. Next. And this is a depiction of a Moor. These were black people who fought with Hannibal. And when Hannibal was defeated, fought with the Romans. And finally, uh, they were converted to Islam. And in 710 and 711, led by Tarif. And then Tariq, they went into Spain. And they dominated parts of Spain, Portugal, and France from about 711 to 1492. It was said that they had everything it took to make a nation great. They introduced air conditioning, public hygiene, paved streets, massive libraries. They had cities like Cordova, Alhambra, Seville. These are the names of automobiles now. They were Muslims, and they distinguished themselves. And this is a Moor in North Africa. The names Morocco and Mauritania bear their names today. Next. This is a depiction of Moorish noblemen playing chess in the 11th century in Spain. This is a depiction of Moorish noblemen playing chess in the 11th century in Spain with a white servant. Next. This is a depiction of a Moorish chieftain. All the ladies love this photograph right here. Let's go. Next slide. This is a black Christian in Spain going to fight the Moors. Next. And this is a brother in 16th century Spain. Next. Now this takes us to Russia itself. And this is a black woman from a place called the Crimea. Next. These are, this is a depiction of one of the Madonnas I took a photograph of. This is in Moscow. Next. And this one too. Now look at that. I just got a little bitty camera, went in a cathedral, and shot. Next. And this is the kind of cathedral that these things come out of. You see the walls are full of these icons. You see the picture of Jesus right here with the fro and the beard? Next. Now, this is the maternal great-grandfather of Pushkin. He was given the name Abram Petrovich, and he dropped that name and took the name Hannibal in recollection of his African ancestor. Next. This is his son. Next. And this is Pushkin himself. Next slide. Now, what they tried to do the Russians, although they acknowledged his African ancestry, they tried to lighten him up. Let's go to the next one. But this is what I found. You ought to clap or something for that one right there. Now that is what Pushkin looked like. Pushkin gloried in his African ancestry. Next slide. There's the actual statue. That's Pushkin over there, and that's me right there. That's true. <laughs> Next. <laughs> this is Pushkin's study at the time of his death. Pushkin was so important that when he died, Russians actually stopped their clocks. He died at quarter to three in the afternoon on the 29th of January, 1837. 
And this is his library. This is his study. I actually had a chance to go into Pushkin's study. Look at his desk. See the manuscript. And you can feel the spirit of Pushkin in there. At least I thought that. And you could, uh, you see his desk, and at the time of his death, he was working on a manuscript on his maternal grandfather called The Moor of Peter the Great. Now, I actually had a chance to see a modern version. He only finished seven chapters, and he refers to him as the Moor, the African, and the black. Pushkin was a small brother. I was told he's about the size of Sammy Davis. A ladies' man. At the time he died, he had relations with 36 different women. That didn't kill him. He died in a duel. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 36 sisters. Well, not sisters, 36 women. Next. And this is what's on his desk. Now, you can't see the picture of Pushkin. It's cut off. But this is an African figurine on Pushkin's writing desk. He had one, I went in two of his residences, the place where he lived right after he got married and the place where he lived during the time of his death, and these figurines are identical. There's an African. Pushkin knew who he was 200 years ago. <laughs> hey, you tell me, sister. Ignorance. Next. Slavery. This is a statue of Pushkin in Moscow. Next. Now, these are black folks. Let me wind down. In recent history, in the recent history of Russia, you see the black woman, the brother, everybody, really. This photograph was taken in 1949. Next. This photograph is of a brother named Razan Abibikov. And this photograph was taken in the Caucasus Mountains in 1913. Let's not go there. Next slide. Now, let me finish up. And I want you to give every one of these a round of applause, and I'll tell you why. Because these are the people who, for the last hundred years or so, have been documenting our history. Every time I do a presentation, I try to take time to show some images of African scholars, race men and race women, historians who have been documenting the history of African people in the most difficult of times. This brother is Reverend Dr. Joseph Elias Hain. He wrote four books on African people dealing with the African origins of European civilization, including the Greeks and the Romans. These books were published from about 1895 to 1911. I found two of them right here in the Schoenberg Library, and nobody knows his name. Give him a black hand. One of the books even appears to be an analysis of the impact of melanin a hundred years ago. Next. This is William Henry Ferris. He went to Yale. He went to Harvard. He became Secretary General of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Worked very closely with Marcus Garvey. He was a, an editor, a minister. In 1911, he wrote a book called The African Abroad, dealing with the African presence in Europe, in 1911. Give him a black hand. He was born in 1873. He died in 1941. He died penniless. They had to find money to bury him. That's a disgrace. A disgrace. We cannot allow that anymore. Next. This is Sister Drusilla Dungey Houston. Give her a hand. She wrote a book called The Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire in 1926. And she had two other manuscripts that we can't find, one of them dealing with the African presence in Europe and the African origins of the Aryans in the 1920s. Next. This is one of my favorites. This is George Wells Parker. Don't wait for me to ask you to applaud them. If not for them, we wouldn't be here. Our history, our, our historians didn't begin with Sheikh Anta Diop and Chancellor Williams, as great as they were. African people have been documenting our history from the time we got off the slave ship. 
These are very important figures in our history. Now, George Wells Parker uh, grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, of all places, same place, I think, where Malcolm's father was murdered, and um, lived in Chicago. He helped form an organization called the Hamitic League of the World. At the time, the term Hamite, Ethiopian, Cushite, these were terms that were applied to African people. He worked closely with Marcus Garvey. In 19, on, I think, April 1st, 1916, he read a paper for the Omaha Philosophical Society called The African Origins of the Grecian Civilization. And then he pam published a pamphlet called Children of the Sun. Next. This is Arthur Alfonso Schoenberg. He was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, I think in 1868. Um, he was a mason. He worked for the post office. Mostly he was a bibliophile. He collected rare books. And he wrote articles in the 1920s about Africans in Moor, Spain. Next slide. This is Namde Ezekiwe. Namde Ezekiwe was the first head of state of Nigeria. He studied under Marcus Garvey and William Leo Hansberry. In 1934, in Crisis Magazine, he wrote an article called The African Background to Greek Mythology in 1934. He lived to be about 90. Next. Give him, give him, give him a round of applause. This is Carter G. Woodson. A lot of people don't know a lot about Carter G. Woodson. Carter G. Woodson was remarkable. He was born in 1875. He was very poor almost taught himself to read and write. He graduated from high school when he was 20. In order to further his education and get some money, he worked in a coal mine, went to Harvard. In 1916, he founded the Journal of Negro History. And in the 1930s, there were, in three consecutive journals, there was an article on the African presence in English literature, in Spanish literature, and French literature. Carter G. Woodson, a race man. Next slide. We're going to finish up. This is the greatest to me of them all. And this is Joel Augustus Rogers. Okay. J. A. Rogers. This is the greatest to me of them all. And this is Joel Augustus Rogers. Okay. J. A. Rogers. <laughs> Rogers was born in Jamaica in 1883. He knew Garvey as a youth in Jamaica. Although never a member of the UNIA, he lectured to UNIA locals. His books were reviewed in the Negro world. Rogers wrote and published 17 books about African people. When white publishers refused to publish his works, Rogers undeterred published them himself. Rogers was an African war correspondent. He went to Ethiopia in 1935 and covered the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. His work on the African presence in Europe is the best there has been. That's J.A. Rogers. That's a tough brother there. Now these are my heroes. These are what some people think of like Michael Jordan, you see him on TV. These are my icons. Next. This is William Leo Hansberry. William Leo Hansberry was the uncle of Lorraine Hansberry, and of course Lorraine Hansberry is the person who, thank you brother, is the person who wrote um, Raisin in the Sun. This is her uncle. Uh, he was a student of W.B. Du Bois. He went uh, to Harvard, and he didn't write about the African presence in Europe. He has a book called Africa and Africans as seen by, class, I think, by classical historians or classical writers. And he wrote about uh, European historians who went to Africa and documented the African presence. It's an excellent book. Max, let me show you about three or four more of these. Yeah, give it up. Come on. Focus. Now, who knows who that is? No, nope, not John Henry Clark. George G.M. James. George Granville Mona James. How many of you have the book or know about the book Stolen Legacy? That's the man who wrote it. And many people say he gave his life for that book. He was born in Guyana. 
Now, when he wrote that book, the book was published in 1954, and at the time, he was working at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, one of the historically black colleges. Now, I lectured at that same school last September, didn't get a cent, but I wanted to do it because I believe the most important thing is that this information be disseminated. But more important than that, or as equally important, it was where uh, James taught when the book was published. They don't even have a copy of the book in the library. This is a historically black college. It's not even in the library. They don't have a picture of James on the campus. They don't have a statue of George G.M. James. So I thought that when I went to Guyana, where he was from, one of the foremost objectives I would have was to get biographical information on George G.M. James. You know, Stolen Legacy attempted to show the African basis of what it's come to be called Greek philosophy. And so I went to Guyana. Do you know they don't even know who George G.M. James is? That's a damn shame. That's almost criminal. Next slide. Now this is uh, John Coleman de Graff Johnson. He wrote a book, yeah, give it up, come on. Yeah, I just got two or three more to go. Uh, he wrote a book called African Glory, the Story of Vanished Negro Civilizations. That was also published in 1954, around the same time of Stolen Legacy. And the book was reviewed by William Leo Hansberry. Now in the book he talks about the Moors and the Moorish invasion of Europe. Next. He was from Ghana. This is John G. Jackson. Okay. John Glover Jackson. And when I lived in California, I was able to invite him to come to Los Angeles and speak. He had never been in California before. And I had him in my apartment, and we would sit and talk. And I fell in love with that old man, and I think he admired me too. I could call him any time of day. I remember I called him about 11 o'clock one night, just wanted to talk to him, and I said, Professor Jackson, I hope I'm not calling you too late. And he says, Renoko, time has no meaning to me. And he would laugh and joke. He was born on April, he had a great sense of humor. He was born on April the 1st, 1907, in Aiken, South Carolina. And he would say, I was born on April the 1st. I was born on April Fool's Day, and I've been a fool ever since. That's the way he would talk. Next slide. He wrote Introduction to African Civilizations, <laughs> Ages of Gold and Silver, Man, God, and Civilization. He had a pamphlet called Was Jesus Christ a Negro? This is Dr. Edward Vivian Scobie. <laughs> and he just became an ancestor a little while ago. Uh, I didn't get to know Dr. Scobie that well, but we talked. I attended some of his lectures. He attended some of my lectures at the First World. I'm sure he lectured for UAM. He was born in Dominica. He moved to England. He was a member of the Royal, what do they call it, the Royal Air Force. And then he got a taste of British racism. Um, his life was threatened. He moved to, back to Dominica. He became the mayor of the capital of Dominica, a city called Rosu, I think Rosu. Uh, he, at the time of his death, was the world's leading authority on the African presence in early Europe. He had a book called Black Britannia. He has several articles on the African presence in early Europe. And in a book called The Golden Age of the Moor, which Brother Bay talked about last week, edited by Dr. Van Sertema, I actually had a chance to edit his work and John Jackson's work. Imagine that. I even still have the manuscripts that they wrote on. That's Dr. Edwin Vivian Scobie. Next and last slide. And this is the last one. This lady is not a historian. I don't even know who she is. But I cut, I cut this out of a calendar. And I was struck by this. Photo. I love African people. I especially love African women. And I love the elders. Okay? And this lady, you know, I mean, this really brought a lot home to me. And I close with this slide. This is kind of like who we are to me and what we are as a people. Great people, ancient and wise, but kind of asleep. We dozed off a little bit. Now it's time for us to wake up. History is something that can provide that spark. History is something that can excite us. Malcolm X said, of all our studies, it is history 
that is most qualified to reward our research. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. Okay. Brothers and sisters, please don't leave. Please don't leave. Please don't leave. Uh, I think you would agree with me. You had an outstanding educational forum this evening, didn't we? Didn't we? And I think uh, part of the message is that we've got to know our history. If you don't know where you've been, you don't have any idea where you're going, and you don't know what to teach your children, just stay there with me for one minute, all right? Uh, you know uh, we have our work cut out for us. And the brother here gave us a brilliant, brilliant presentation. What I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to ask you to meet your African consciousness and dig a little deeper. Dig a little deeper, all right? You know what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to help us meet our obligations. We're going to need a few more ducats from you tonight. We're going to need a little more cash from you tonight, okay? Brothers and sisters, try not to leave yet, all right? We're going to have baskets going around, and the basket doesn't meet you before you leave. What I'd like you to do...